here at the Open Mobile Summit, and we're pleased to be joined by Trip Hawkins. He is the CEO of If You Can, and Trip, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Please tell us first a little bit about your role there and the company as well. Well, I'm one of the co-founders of the company, and we're making a new game service called If that is trying to make a breakthrough in how to deliver legitimate educational curriculum through a game. And if people don't know, you were the founder of Electronic Arts, the video game giant as well, so yes. you clearly have the pedigree and the background. Talk to us a little bit about why sort of the educational games area. I mean, you clearly know the entertainment side of it very well, but, but what is driving you to the education side, which is sort of a, a nascent market. There are a number of folks who are sort of trying to come in at different angles. I think the time is now for technologies and games to finally have a legitimate constructive impact on education. Uh, it's funny because we, we got off to an early start 30 years ago with typing tutors. Uh, typing is legitimate curriculum and it was lined up with good measurements and good gameplay. And then the industry never really followed up to broaden that approach across other areas of curriculum. Meanwhile, uh, at Electronic Arts, I was doing the EA Sports games and recently uh, recognized that there's an enormous opportunity to bring that kind of business model into educational applications by bringing in the same, the same way that we brought in a sports experts like coaches and mm -hmm. players and bring in the data about the statistics of the players and the specifications about the rules. You can use the same methodology bringing in curriculum experts and teaching standards and you know, specifications about what it is that needs to be learned. The important thing is to use the power of gameplay because children right now, their attention and their motivation is in a mobile device playing a game and you have to meet people where they are and that's, that's where you really need to bring uh, the learning now because that's where uh, they're paying attention. And certainly with younger kids, they're able to access and use mm -hmm. tablets in some cases more easily than some of their older counterparts. There's some shocking statistics about how rapidly uh, children are gaining access to devices. Just in the last two years, one research study found that children up to the age of eight, two years ago only 8% had access to a tablet and now it's already as high as 40%. And there's a US market number. But uh, there, there's a breathtaking speed at which this is happening. This year alone, there are about a million smartphones and tablets being sold. So it's a global revolution happening very quickly. Now, you, you say you're meeting them where they are, but I'm sure that you've encountered already a number of skeptical parents out there who see this as just another game. There are a lot. It's it's sort of a, a category that's that's fraught with risk because a lot of people would like to bill their games as educational for their kids or for kids for the market. But there's a, a high degree of skepticism, I would imagine, that you encounter. What do you tell the skeptical parents out there who say, "Oh, this is just another excuse for my kid to play on the tablet more"? What's the answer? For I that? think there's uh, valid reasons for the skepticism. The game industry has frankly uh, made a lot of things that parents see as either not having value or actually being detrimental to their children's development. And there are addictive qualities now to mobile devices and games that, uh, that parents are struggling with. So I think you have to kind of turn that around and figure out, well, how can we add value? How can we do something in a correct way that's authentic and true to the curriculum? And again, uh, I'm not a curriculum expert, so we've brought in the world's leading authorities as, as we did with EA Sports back in the day. And you know we're t we take it uh, very seriously. And I think parents today, they have these, this duality of concern because on the one hand, the school climate is very challenging now. And at home, there's questions about mobile addiction. And so if, if we can use gameplay technology to advance a form of learning that goes beyond you know, the, the uh, didactic model that's been around for the last 500 years that's finally uh, challenged, you know, in the face of uh, this, these digital natives right. that are growing up with access to devices and playing games, we're really just saying, hey, you know, there are a lot of games that don't offer kids a lot of value. Why don't we have a game that's just as much fun, but that has a seamless blending of curriculum and story that are so in context that it continues to be really fun, but has a lot of learning value. What's the highest barrier for you, aside from maybe selling some of the parents, but is it selling it to school systems? Is it trying to get tablets into children's hands? That itself has caused some problems, such as in Los Angeles, where you've had kids hacking mm -hmm. into some of the iPods and going, or iPads where they're not supposed to go. <clears throat> Which of those, or is there a, a greater 
barrier out there for companies such as you for accessing this market? It's a very good question. We have to you know, do it in, in steps. The first step for us is to offer uh, a game service that's called IF, uh, and it's free to play. So anybody that uh, wants to try it, uh, it'll debut uh, later this year on the iPad. Anybody that wants to can try it for free and they can see for themselves what it is. And you start, you start there in the consumer market and that product will allow uh, parents that decide that they like it to become a subscriber, almost like a magazine subscription where there's new story and new curriculum content every month through that subscription. And we, we believe that uh, over time we can build up the, the support of the academic community and the parent community and the school and teacher communities that will then make it easier for us to uh, you know, offer it in the right way to the formal classroom. But as a bridge to that, there are a lot of aftercare programs where we already have a tremendous amount of interest from schools and from uh, organizations like the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. What about other companies who are, are maybe coming up from a different angle where they're, I don't want to say they're just bringing textbooks to life for the iPad, but there are a lot of companies who are doing some interesting things in that space. Is that someone you see as competition, potential partnerships? How, do, how does that go as, as a trend that we're seeing in, in this nascent marketplace right now? I think they're potential partnerships. You know, clearly, the tablet is a profound and amazing platform and device they're going to take over. And you certainly should have that be a place where you can do reading and surf the internet and you know, have a variety of resources at your disposal. But obviously, if the, only, the, only, if, the, if the tablet is only going to be a new type of book, that's not going to create much of a revolution. The, the, the thing about games is that they're interactive and people learn by doing. I mean, brain scientists proved a long time ago that the single best way to increase human intelligence is through interaction. It's the fastest way to grow new brain cells and neurotransmitter connections. I think we all kind of instinctively understand that you learn more in the real world than you do reading or sitting in a classroom. And you, know, you, can, you can learn by doing, you can learn by observing, mm -hmm. and computers have the ability to measure everything that you're doing. And that can, be, that can conform to how curriculum should be presented, and it can conform to teaching standards for that curriculum. Now you talk a little bit about, you know, game, all games have some kind of a fun component. Some of them wear out very quickly. How do you keep that fun element for something that's educational, but still, you know, you, you keep them involved yeah. but without moving on to another app or, or trying to play something that's Yeah, that's where that's this is a very tricky collaboration, and I, and I think the reason it hasn't really happened in a way that has been a breakthrough that is scaled up across a lot of curriculum is that it's hard to do because you have to bring in the curriculum experts that don't understand how to make a fun game and the game developers that don't really understand kids and maybe haven't even become parents so they don't you know they don't really know that much about kids right. typically and they don't really care you I know mean, generally most game developers they want to make a game that they want to play and it's mostly an industry dominated by young men and you've got to get those communities knitted together and all I can say is that we take that challenge very seriously, and it does involve many of the same steps as, as we're required to make successful EA sports simulation games. Right, and, and you know, EA certainly, you know, with, with the sports title, it, it gets on the shelf, you download it or whatever, it, it sort of is what it is, everyone knows what it is, the category. Do you have to cross higher barriers to reach your customer? Um, is there more difficult distribution and discovery as well of this type of product versus a sports game or, or some other kind of an app? I think that uh, the word's going to get around and I, I believe that there will be a lot of parents and teachers that will refer if to others and you can try it for free. Right. Uh, that, that's, that's one of the most powerful things about the internet is the ability to download something over the air, over the internet and try it for free. If it's good, then that cream is going to rise to the top. Now is it is it interactive? Does it Are you sort of streaming it online or you download and you, you play it locally so you're not needing bandwidth to play? Yeah, you can play it locally and then of course when you move on to new chapters of content there may be some data that you're going to pull right. off the server from time to time. But uh, you know, again, I think the most important thing is uh, we have a bunch of really knowledgeable game developers that have tremendous history and experience making fun games for the age range that we're shooting at which is pre-teen. And that's, that's really what it's got to be about. You can't just uh, take broccoli and cover it with chocolate and expect that to taste good. Right. What's the, uh, the revenue model here? I mean, a subscription, so you, it's free to play, but only for a few chapters, and then once you're hooked, presumably, 
you start paying a, a yeah, monthly basis? Yeah, we see basis this. Uh, what, what he sees a, a, a change here is that this is something that involves both the parent and the child. And I would say most applications in the mobile market today are one or the other. It's either something the adult is using or something the child is using, and they kind of operate a bit differently. But now here's something where there's a partnership, where a parent that has concerns about what they want their child to learn in terms of life skills that will help them prepare to function in, a, in the school right. and pick up skills that are perhaps being uh, you know, not included in what's going on in the classroom, you know, they're going to be more motivated to have their child do this because it's more valuable for the child than your typical entertainment game. And, and then, of course, that won't work unless the child is engaged and entertained. So you really have to know how to do both. All right. Well, Trip Hawkins, the CEO of If You Can, thank you so much for joining us here at the Open Mobile Summit.